In the late 1930s, there was growing unrest across the world. Extreme right-wing parties across Europe were growing in strength. German Chancellor Adolf Hitler had started a programme of rearmament. The Spanish Civil War was raging and the Nazis were threatening to invade countries across Europe. In 1938, Britain stood on the precipice of World War. The Admiralty were already making preparations. In the summer of 1939, the government started to requisition and purchase trawlers with the specific purpose of using them as part of a potential war effort. During the First World War, the fishing industry had played a really major and still underestimated uh, contribution to the war. Uh, not only in terms of maintaining the beleaguered nation's fish supply, but of course uh, it involved in admiralty service, both mine sweeping and anti-submarine patrol work. But a large number of fishermen had been lost to the war in the early months because they'd been taken up by the, the, the army. This was avoided in the run-up to the Second World War. You know, fishing was an occupation where, if you were going to, as a result of legislation, where if you were going to come out of it, you would, you would actually go into either, uh, you know, the, the, the Royal Navy, as we'd know it for the patrol service, as it was going to become, or you would be able to go in the Royal Navy. Uh, so fishermen, their unique skill set, were going to be uh, used in that way. This was recognised before the war, and that was an important part of it. Plus, the Admiralty had learned a lot of lessons in the First World War about the way that fishing vessels could be used. In the last months of the war, the First World War, or the last year or so of the First World War, they'd increasingly formed trawlers that were still fishing into armed units, uh, usually guided or, by, or, or including a couple of trawlers that were armed. And that process was started quite early on in the Second World War, particularly at places like Hull and Grimsby. The Admiralty were keen to grab hold of the trawlers, uh, having seen what they could do in the First World War. And actually, I think somebody else who was instrumental was Churchill, because Churchill had been the, uh, the first Sea Lord of the Admiralty from 1911 till 1915, one of his many jobs in government, you know. And, um, and he did visit the fishing ports, and he knew what, full well uh, what the trawlers could do in the Dardanelles and uh, in, no in Norway as well later on. Um, and so I think maybe he laid down some of the principles uh, for maybe why the were, Admiralty were keen to enlist uh, the, uh, the trawlers and get them in uh, frontline warfare, you know, with the, against the Germans. On the 3rd of September 1939, two days after Germany's invasion of Poland, Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain announced that France and Britain had declared war on Germany. In the 1930s, Grimsby and Hull had the biggest fishing and whaling fleets in the world. In World War I, the Admiralty requisitioned trawlers and their crews, but found them to be difficult to control. So a different approach was taken in World War II. You see, the, the Admiralty, I think they overreacted at first with regard to how many trawlers they wanted. And they had a dilemma as well about the fishermen. They, they knew that the fishing fleets had two fair purposes to provide. One was to protection um, and the other was to feed the nation. Fish was never rationed. There were lots of rationing throughout the war of bread and milk and other produce. But fish was never rationed. And so the older trawlers that the Admiralty didn't want uh, for war service were transferred over to Fleetwood and, uh, and Milford Haven. And they kept the supplies coming by fishing in the uh, Irish Sea <coughs> and off the coast, around the coast of Ireland and up to Faroes and uh, some to Iceland. It was only like the older vessels and like mostly the older men that were uh, still operating out of Hull. Of course, with uh, what was going on with the blockades with the Germans and that lot, the laying of the mines and all that sort of stuff, food, well, uh, f the fishing and that lot, it was a uh, cheap staple food. So when it comes to it, uh, it had to be caught, regardless of the cost. They knew that where there was mines, nobody had been fishing for a while, so that there was a healthy stock of fish there. And of course, a lot of the uh, skippers that were actually caught doing that were pretty heavily fined as an example to uh, other crews not to actually do that. But uh, not, not many of them took notice of that. They still did it regardless. A trawler that was 
actually owned by the same firm that I sailed in for many years, uh, Thomas Hamlings, and it was called the St Nidan. And he was fishing uh, off the west coast of Scotland, and he, he was actually catching a, quite a little bit of fish, you know, so he was very happy until a German U-boat suddenly came up alongside of him. And the German U-boat uh, captain uh, sent a signal across saying, I want you to get in the lifeboat with your crew and come because we are going to uh, sink your vessel. And it, it's based on orders from uh, Hitler himself, really, that any fishing vessel caught trawling for fish had to be sunk because they were supplying the country with fish. They were feeding the country and uh, the Germans wanted to starve us out of it. As in the First World War, uh, the North Sea was an important theatre, very important. And of course, it was accessible to German vessels more easily than perhaps anywhere else, apart from after France was occupied. Uh, and of course, what it led to was not only a large number of the more modern trawlers being taken up, uh, but it led to the movement of many of the other vessels that remained fishing round to the west coast. So Fleetwood for the war period and places like Milford became much more important uh, than they had been prior to the war. Uh, uh, for places like Hull, it meant that the industry was decimated for, for long periods of the war uh, because, of course, uh, large Hull had the most modern fleet, so, so many of its vessels were taken, and equally those that were left were moved increasingly to the west coast. Trawlers sailed regular to, uh, to actually go catching fish. And in fact, there was a system where uh, they would actually go to Iceland and the Faroe Islands, places of danger, uh, in convoy. So you would get something like six trawlers sailing off in convoy with armed trawlers, with Royal Navy uh, officers on board, actually looking after them. And it was very well done because there was uh, orders for them and plans for them. I wonder attack they all had to, uh, they didn't scatter, they all had to come in certain line and the armed trawlers would go around and protect them. And some of these uh, fishing vessels actually ended up where the, they would be armed so they could protect themselves as well. Maybe just machine guns or something. But they actually was going to, away to Iceland, the Faroe Islands, just to catch fish and bring back to feed the country. Increasing likelihood of war did tend to retard investment in, in new trawlers because trawler owners weren't daft. They knew that the first vessels that the Admiralty would be after would be the largest and the most modern. So there was a bit of an incentive, certainly in some ports, to retain your older vessels, hoping that you'd still be able to fish because, of course, although fishing during wartime was highly dangerous, it was also highly profitable because of the returns that could be made. The trawler owners um, had the choice to either hire um, the trawlers to the Navy or to sell them. Um, and after the war, the trawlers got converted back and the trawler owners got, if, if they'd sold to the Navy, the trawler owners were given the first chance to buy those trawlers back. All other ships had to be converted but unfortunately, Grimsby didn't have the means to convert. I can imagine in Grimsby there'd be a lot of, I don't know the exact number, but a lot of trawlers from Grimsby had to be converted. When they were converted, the fish rooms were made into accommodation and the original forecastle um, was used for stores. I know that mainly the anti-submarine, um, the trawlers that were requisitioned for anti-submarine uh, were mainly the deep water trawlers and the smaller, older trawlers, I think mainly middle water or closer to shore trawlers, they were mainly used for mine sweeping. Well, the first thing you have to recognise is that the fishing trawlers in their day-to-day -day work life were very safe and stable vessels. And that was, of course, because they were designed for that particular task that they were doing. Um, and one of the important parts of that was that they carried fish. They started the voyage empty, but by the end of the voyage, they had a full load of fish, which is different from any other 
vessels who carry cargo and the, the cargo remains the same from beginning to end of the voyage. Once they became commissioned into the Navy, it was a different job. There was no fish, there was no cargo to carry, but there were changes being made to the ship. That change was adding equipment, war equipment on the deck, uh, guns for anti-aircraft defence, uh, various e bits of equipment, and in, uh, one, in addition to that they wanted an extra height to the wheelhouse so they had better view around the ocean. The trawlermen themselves, their skills in other theatres of war were also recognised. So you get trawlermen who've got these wonderful skills being used in all sorts of other theatres. So what roles did our trawlermen do? What were the men being prepared for? Their toughness and resolve would be essential in some of Britain's darkest hours. To give you some idea of the sheer numbers of men involved in naval support roles, 66,000 men served in the Royal Naval Patrol Service alone, but we now know that many more served in the Royal and Merchant Navies. The first few months of World War II became known as the Phony War. No real action had been seen by the British and the expected blitzkriegs hadn't materialised. If you were on UK soil, things seemed very quiet indeed. This, however, hid the reality of the fast advancing Nazi forces across much of what we might now refer to as the ex-Eastern Bloc countries, the lowlands of Europe and further north, across towards Scandinavia and Russia. And in the spring of 1940, the war became very real to everyone. By the spring of 1940, the Allies were being overwhelmed on both the Norwegian and French fronts. Heavy losses in both campaigns at Namsos in Norway and Dunkirk in France meant only one option was available, rescue. And it was our men and trawlers who were key in the rescue operations. My uncles, they're my dad's brothers, and they were both in the war. Um, they were fishermen, and they both went to sea at the age of 14. There was about two years between them. Les was the elder one and Robert, Uncle Bob, was the younger one. And it was Leslie Smith and Robert James Smith. Hull men were generally sent to Milford Avon or up to Aberdeen. And Le uh, Les was sent to Aberdeen. And there he picked up his trawler, which was a Hull trawler, which had just come back from Norway, called the, um, the Arab. When it landed at Aberdeen, they'd been uh, on in Norway, they'd brought back a lot of uh, uh, soldiers from Norway, because it was aborted, was the invasion. Um, and then they took on new crew, and uh, Les was one of the new crew. And then he went straight off to Dunkirk. And I was asking him, uh, a long time later, because he'd been on the Russian convoys, which I'll tell you about. Did you ever have nightmares about being on the Russian convoys? No, he said, but I have nightmares every night. I said, oh, well, what about? He said, don't care. So I said, well, what do you mean? It was, I know it was bad. He said, no, he said, we got to Dunkirk. We rescued quite a few English men. He said, you've got to realise they're stood in lines in the water up to the necks in the water if the tide comes in. He said, we goes back on about our fifth trip. He said, and we're giving you orders. No Englishmen, you've got to take French. He said, we gets to the line up. He said, and of course the lads want to come on board. And we're telling them they can't come on, but they're insisting. He said, and then they gave us sweeping brushes and we had to push them back into the sea. He said, we couldn't see them, we were all crying. These are tough fishermen. And they're having to push English lads back into the sea. He said, and the names they called us, they still tell me in my dreams every night. One uncle was uh, Ted, or Edward Nicholson, who was uh, lost off the trawler Silesia. 
in the Second World War. He was a, on a minesweeper at the time, and uh, unfortunately she hit a, a mine in the River Umber. Uh, some of the crew were, were washed ashore later, and he, uh, he turned up on Cleeforts Beach, and the only identity they knew about him was uh, tattoos and a signet ring he had on which his grandmother identified him by. The youngest one, a 13, Sam, as they called him, <coughs> but his na real name was James. Uh, looking at the record there, he was 21 when he died. He was on the Blackburn Rovers, which ironically was sunk, it in a mine, in an English minefield. Either coming from Dunkirk or going to Dunkirk. My father went back fishing later on. Um, he was on the convoy duties, the Atlantic and Africa. Obviously escorting convoys to Africa for supplies. Um, and the story is, that this is what I've been told. My father had a, <coughs> a speech impediment which made him stammer and stutter a lot. And I thought, well, when we questioned families, why, was he born like that? I said, no, during the war. And we're guessing that a ship he was on, the HMS Dunluce Castle, I'm not sure, was torpedoed, and we was told that he spent a lot of time in the water. And while he was in the water, he swallowed oil and stuff that damaged his vocal cords. And that's the reason why. He spoke like he did. My dad, his name was George Edward Wingfield, and he was a fisherman. And when he was 18, he joined up and he went in the Navy as a stoker. His fair ship was the Grey Goose, and that was a converted trawler. And the skipper on the Grey Goose was Peter Scott. And Peter Scott was the son of the famous Peter Scott. So that was his fair ship. Um, and then he went to America to bring back the wooden hulled ships. Because the ships we had were metal, they thought that if they had wooden hulls, they wouldn't attract the mines. So this is why America must have developed them and then they brought them over. Um, so I don't know how many times he went there, but I know he did at least, at least one trip. And then he was on the General Bofa to the naval base at HMS Pembroke in Chatham. And from there he was sweeping um, Lowestoft to the Thames. He also went down the um, River Rhine, man sweeping. Um, so again, he was in a lot of danger down there, again under fire. He was uh, on the trawl of the Lord Hood and he was sweeping the English Channel. He came off the Lord Hood and for the D-Day landings, he joined the MMS 192, which was a motor minesweeper. So different from the coal, this was a motor minesweeper. Um, and he was in the engine room and they'd come across to pick up troops on the D-Day landing. They went back, came back with equipment and went back and they came across with part of a Mulberry Harbour but on one of those crossings it broke down and they came under heavy fire and they t were taking on water and my dad being in the engine room he was up to his knees um, trying to get this help with the help of someone else trying to get the ship underway again because the last thing he wanted to be was under fire in that, in that part of the world definitely. And when they got back, the ship was awarded a medal for bravery under fire. Um, and they, because there was just the one medal, they drew lots. And the cook got the medal, which was fine because the cook was there as well. After the D-Day landings, the war records, his war records show that he was sent back to Lowestoft. And then from the Lowestoft, he was sent back to the Humber area. Um, and this was in 1944. I was born in January 1945, so he obviously um, managed to get home for a few days. 
Look it up. <laughs> the Nazis advanced through Northern Europe very early in the war and communist Russia was not prepared for war at all. One of the Nazis' weapons of war was starvation, and they knew that in order to take control of Russia, they needed to move swiftly across to Moscow. The Russian convoys were a lifeline for the people and their war effort, delivering both weapons and food. The Admiralty had become interested in trawlers before the First World War because of their capability as minesweeping vessels. And this, of course, was an important role, again, in the Second World War, minesweeping all over the place. So that was important. But they were also, of course, involved in anti-submarine uh, anti work, as they had been in the First War. But convoy patrolling and convoy escort duties were incredibly important as well. In the First World War, the Admiralty had not accepted the importance of convoys until almost the last year of the war. They didn't do that in the Second World War, they realised how important they were. So that was an important aspect of the job as well. My father was called Robert Jordan, everyone known, knew him as Bob, and he was born on Hesel Road in 1924. When he was 16, he joined the Merchant Navy. Um, he was on quite a few uh, vessels, and including the infamous Russian convoys. The first one, what he was torpedoed in, was the PQ-17, which is infamous that they were left like sitting ducks. The, um, the order was given for them to scatter all the, um, the, you know, the vessels that were supposed to be protecting them, shall we say, and they were left. However, the must have fell, God only knows. He was 18 at this point and they were sitting ducks. PQ-17 was the largest ever and most ambitious convoy that had been planned to date. The 41 ships that made up the convoy left Iceland on the 27th of June, 1941, and made its way across the Barents Sea. Its aim? To reach the post of Archangel Nemomansk in Russia. Right, now to explain what is going on, <clears throat> it's June 1942, mm -hmm. um, America's come in the war and they're our ally, Russia has been invaded and they're our ally but very, and America can't send warships, they're busy in the Pacific because they've been uh, bombed at Pearl Harbor in December of 41. So all these American supply merchant navy ships with all the tanks, the planes, the armoured stuff for Russia has come to Iceland because the Americans have taken over Iceland as a base. On the 24th of June, this is when the convoy sets sail. On the 4th of July, the American ships have got all the flags out. It's their Independence Day when our uh, Royal Naval ships are told that the battleship, the Tirpitz, which is the German battleship, one of the big ships, was sailing out of a fjord in Norway. This is Norway, as Norway had been overrun. The convoy, the um, battleships, and all the ships in the convoy, except the Merchant Navy, are told to scatter. The Merchant Navy is then told to scatter, but they've no protection. Now, before this scatter came, they'd got right round here into the Norwegian Sea. Now, Norway, as I said, is overrun by Germany, and they've got the um, aerodromes, and they're sending planes to bomb the convoy. And our ships are firing at them, then our ships are told to scatter, and scatter the do, and we're going to get um, the ships being picked off one by one, by submarines. On July the 5th, yes, the Tirpitz and the Hipper, I think they called it, and another battleship did sail out, but was told, no need, the convoy is being destroyed by our submarines. But some of the ships did escape, and that's what we're going to tell you about now. Right. right. <laughs> 
by Leo Gladwell. Was a, it was born about 1900. He was a midshipman okay. uh, in the Royal Navy during the First World War. After the war, he became a barrister. In 1939, he was recalled to the service and he was given the command of the destroyer Ayrshire, uh, sorry, uh, armed troll of Ayrshire. He, uh, he ignored the order to scatter three, three times. He, he continued on his way as normal. Next day, he found he was accompanied by a, a ship called the Troubadour, which was carrying coal and uh, general cargo. The Troubadour captain decided to uh, get in touch with Gladwell and asked him if he could have his protection, which Gladwell gave on the assumption that he could have some of the bunkering call what he was carrying. Next day, the founder of two more ships had joined them, and that was the Iron Sand and the Silver Sword. Gladwell decided then to go into the ice field at the top end. Mm -hmm. <coughs> they decided then, they got stuck in the ice field, so they decided then to uh, have a meeting on the ice and decide that all the ships would be painted white with paint that had been took off the troubadour. So they painted all the ships white as far as they could. All the decks and uh, deck furniture sort of thing was all covered in sheets, white sheets, anything white to disguise their appearance. They stayed on the ice till, uh, for a couple of weeks, I believe, and then the uh, I started to break up and with the guide of uh, having an old sextant and an um, atlas from school um, and some information of some of the crew who had been in the area before the war fishing, they decided to break out and cut through the ice and come back to the top end of Russia about three or four weeks after the convoy had scattered. Well, after, after the scatter of the uh, merchant ships, so, say there was uh, 24 out of the 35 were sunk, so there was a lot of men who was in open boats. Eventually, quite a few of them arrived at this island up here. The Russians sent in a, a well-known Russian uh, a pilot who uh, arrived by a seaplane, and he took in supplies to, this, to the men who were stranded there. And there was also, I think, three ships at the same spot. And um, he eventually he carried on taking in supplies, but eventually he took all the men who was on the island back off and he took them back to Russia again. And then eventually from Russia, they came back over here. The three trawlers, uh, two of the Lord Line, um, and one was the Northern Gem as well, they managed to get to Archangel and they felt <coughs> really bad that they knew that the Merchant Navy was sitting ducks. Now this did a lot of harm, did this PQ-17, the relationship between the Merchant Navy, which are not servicemen. These are working for businesses, they're doing trade, same as they would do in peacetime. And the Royal Navy, who are the servicemen who was to protect them. Of the 41 ships that started the PQ-17 convoy, 24 were lost. 14 reached Archangel, delivering just 70,000 tonnes of supplies from the original 200,000 tonnes. The Humber ports were an important base for clandestine activities throughout the war and Britain needed to deliver and collect a whole range of products and people to and from continental Europe. Before Churchill was Prime Minister, he had visited many of the UK's ports, the Humber included, and he understood how strategically important the Humber's position would be for undercover operations. Well, the secret war, that was, uh, you know, it did save us um, a lot. You know, we talk a lot about Betch Bletchley Park, don't we, and uh, the Enigma Code and everything else, and radar for the watching the um, watching the Luftwaffe and that coming in 
during the Battle of Britain. But also at sea, there was something that maybe a lot of people don't know about, and that is the Aztecs. And again, um, you know, the uh, this was the um, uh, this is where the, ant the trawlers were used primarily, uh, purely to um, track down submarines, uh, German U-boats, and of which there were various kinds of U-boats as well, which we can talk about later on. But um, uh, the Aztec, it was uh, some initials, um, 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 an acronym, and it stands for Anti-Submarine Detection Investigation Committee. And um, again, the trawlermen were enlisted to use this very uh, cutting-edge uh, technology uh, talk about Silicon Valley and all the things that people talk about, drones and, and satellites and artificial intelligence today. But this was, Aztecs was the cutting edge of technology. And the trawlermen were there with it. Although some trawlermen, you know, from the Humber ports were captured by the Germans, not one of them in these prisoner war camps divulged to the Germans about the Aztecs. You know, the Germans would have loved to have gotten hold of, uh, you know, these, these Aztec equipment that was so pioneering. <coughs> uh, it might have changed the course of the war. Another really curious dimension, of course, is that the trawlermen themselves, their skills in other theatres of war were also recognised. So you get trawlermen who've got these wonderful skills being used in all sorts of other theatres. If I take someone like my, um, uh, my, my great-uncle, Bernard Stipetic, who after the Second World War became one of Hull's leading trawler skippers. But during the Second World War, he ended up in the Levant Flotilla. The Levant Flotilla was involved in all sorts of work, and his particular job was to work on um, a disguised uh, Greek fishing vessel running SOE um, operatives into the Aegean during the liberation of Greece. And he got the DSC for that. It's a bit shades of uh, the guns of Navarone, really. Prime Minister Winston Churchill knew how important espionage was to help Britain and the Allies win the war. The Special Operations Executive was set up by Winston Churchill and it was affectionately known as the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Conduct. Churchill asked Hugh Dalton, Minister of Economic Warfare, Ian Fleming, at that time working in naval intelligence, and Arctic explorer Sir George Binney to set up secret operations and organise fast trips across the North Sea using motor gunboats from Hull and Immingham into neutral Sweden. These were called Operation Bridford. Without ball bearings, you'd have no tanks, you'd have no machinery uh, and the aircraft and everything. The whole, lots of wars and uh, whether we know it or not, you know, it's all run on ball bearings. And the best ball bearings in the world are Swedish. And it's um, S uh, SKF factory near Gothenburg uh, that produced the best. And as you know, although Norway, Norway got conquered by the Germans, uh, Sweden became remained neutral somehow, a bit like Switzerland, and um, wasn't directly involved in the war. And um, so... Both British and German merchant boats were in a, were able to dock in Gothenburg and Malmo and Stockholm and other uh, Swedish ports, and um, but then you know we were getting desperate. You know the more the war went on in the Far East and the deserts and uh, anywhere uh, around the world, um, the demand for ball bearings was increasing, and increasing. So can you tell us a little bit about why it was perceived that the English ate so much butter? I will. Well, why they ate so much butter was one of the best kept secrets in Hull during World War II. Um, it, was the, it was nicknamed the ball bearing run. In actual fact, the country had run out of ball bearings. So did every other country run out of ball bearings and you could not make any aircraft, ships anything without ball bearings, so they had to have ball bearings. There's two countries that had ball bearings. One was Russia, that was a no-go area, mm -hmm. and one was Sweden, which was neutral. So that was the obvious choice to go to Sweden and get ball bearings. But how do you do it? So Churchill came up with the idea with his uh, secret army, so-called secret army. He'd get all these men on little tiny ships to whip across the North Sea go to Sweden, fill the boats up with ball bearings and went back again without anybody noticing them. But he didn't realise how dangerous it was 
anyway, you got um, Ian Fleming, the James Bond author, okay. to set up a plan. And he, he included George Binney with this, who had done a lot of Arctic exploring. And they set up this little plan to have these little tiny boats, they were called motor gun boats. Okay. So they had six of these little motor gun boats, and they picked crews from Hull to man the boats. And on each boat, there was an SOE op operative, and he was a second in command. So this brought the SOE into it. So it was a secret mission, so the men never talked about it. So the route that they took, sometimes they used um, Immingham as a place to you with the boats to do some um, activities as well. So the route was across the North Sea, and this piece of water here is called the Skagerrak. Okay. On the corner of the Skagerrak was one of the biggest guns that was ever made, called the Rat. It's still visible from the internet, you can still see it to this day. Mm. So the whole of the Skagerrak was mined, the rat was there, and then the aircraft above. So these little boats had to sail between the Skagerrak into a tiny, tiny little place called... It's debatable how you pronounce it in mm. Swedish, but I call it Lixelle. Liskil, sorry, that's where my pen friend lives up in Sweden. <laughs> so they, they arrived in the harbours here at Liskil, unloaded nothing, went off to the hotel in the town, mm -hmm. escorted by a police officer, who escorted them down one side of the road to a hotel overnight while the boats were filled up in the harbour with butter, crates of butter. They went into the hotel and on the other side of the road there'd be a policeman walking along with all the Germans who would also come for some butter for their country. <laughs> so uh, in the hotel it was uh, Germans one side of the hotel, British the other, having a go at each other, walking down the streets, having a go at each other, what have you come for, you know. But the, the serious part of it was to get out and turn, turn the boats round in the Skagerrak and bring the ball bearings back to Great Britain. Running the Skag, they called it running the, call it blockade busters, running the Skagerrak, running the blockade. There's a few different names for it. So these chaps would um, get on the boat. So about 22 on a boat. The whole of the bottom of the boat was taken out, nothing on it. They had a little cabin on the top with all the men sitting in the cabin at the top, officers and men. And uh, the bottom was for all the ball bearings. And so they tootled back to England with the ball bearings in the dead of night so nobody could see them and get the ball bearing. Paul Mann, John Irvin Jones, BEM, was part of these operations at the age of just 17. He worked on secret operations from both Hull and the South Coast and was awarded the British Empire Medal for his services to the country. The second trip, the second trip, we got there, coming home, homeward bound, I was on, at that time I was on the Gay Viking and we was going out there because you had no light, you didn't have lights, no. only little masthead like me. And what happened, the old well, which I've saved in, that run into us and <gasps> just bang right into us. It's like they're doing about 20, 20 knots and up the full engine room side out, just like that bam. Just, you know, so I was sat there on the controls and with a bam, because I, I had a station on deck at the gun and it, I left the engineer below. We got off the ship and I was, I got off with three more in a float. Two of them jumped out and left me in while I couldn't hold it. So I fell in the water and I had to swim for it. And I don't know, like, it had only been minutes because I would have, it, uh, you know, it started it. And uh, the, the old well stopped to pick me up. Took the other crew up, which he shunted up. The shunter stopped. But my step, my stepfather was on the Opel and he'd gone on to the bridge to the captain and said, they're not going go home without that lad. We know that uh, Churchill actually said that no job was more vital and no job was better done, which is a massive thing to say when you, when you consider all of the different things that were happening during the war. He said, you allowed the nation to breathe and once again, we're proud of you, meaning that, of course, we've done this twice, not just in the First World War, but in the Second World War. But just looking back over our the naval contribution that the men from the Humber ports made in by using the trawlers at war uh, was a great achievement, and one 
which has never been fully recognised yet, you know, by the powers that be. Did anyone think that 80 years after the requisitioning of our Humber men and trawlers was underway, there will be little evidence of any of this activity left? For me, discovering this story has been enlightening and a real privilege to be able to tell it to a wider audience and to make sure that this is never forgotten.